Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 63 of the Benzo Free Podcast. So, so how are you? Kind of hard to figure that out lately, isn't it? Yeah, me too. Like I said in my last video, I'm doing surprisingly well. Busy, very busy, but that's a good thing. And probably part of my good mood. I am a bit bummed because I had to cancel several events this year. You see, I'd lined up a few great events for speaking and participating in conferences and such on mental health and benzos, but this whole virus thing, with all that going on, of course, they got canceled. One of them was a mental health conference in California in May, and you know how I love my road trips. I was really looking forward to that one, partly because I was going to record tons of good stuff for the podcast, including two exciting roundtables and some amazing speakers and even some thoughts and other events from the road. Dr. Stephen Wright pulled me in on this event, thanks Steve, and I was going down to the event along with our friend and benzo organizer, Jill. Events like this are the type of social outlets that I really love. Back, back when I taught screenwriting and worked on festivals, I really enjoyed the actual events themselves. So many amazing people getting together to learn, socialize, connect. I just loved all of it. But, you know, I'm just whining about little things in my life right now. The truth is, even with all those cancellations, I am doing pretty well right now. It's this new perspective that I have on life, and it's pretty damn cool. But I know that is not the case for all of you, and I really did want to check in to see how you are doing. You know, life amid a pandemic, it's strange. Surreal, that's a good word for it. Frightening to some, and yet somehow calming at the same time, I think. It, it's hard to nail down a description of what this whole thing is. You know, I had mentioned to you that one of my favorite and most frequent outings during my withdrawal and beyond was just going to the grocery store in the morning. Four to five times a week, I go to the grocery store get a hot chai to start my day, pick up a few items for the house, and, and go back home to work. Now, not so much. I now go once every seven to ten days, as instructed. Do I miss it? Yeah. But you know what? I adapt, just like we all are doing right now. You know, one of the biggest surprises of this whole thing for me is how people are handling it. No, I'm not talking about the idiots they show on the news, people hoarding groceries, retailers gouging customers, hackers breaking into systems. I'm talking about the people I see or talk to, my, my neighbors, friends, family, co-workers. Whether texting with them, talking to them, or even saying hi on the path as we walk our dog. I'm surprised how normal and even calm the vast majority of people I see are behaving, and it really warms my heart. I mean, this is an unprecedented event in our generation, in some ways in human history. Things are happening now that have never happened before in our memory, and yet I'm not seeing much panic. Not even a lot of worry, although I know it's there. But I'm seeing most people adjusting. They are finding ways to entertain themselves and their families. They are finding ways to help their children with homeschooling. They are finding ways to help their elderly family and friends get the support and supplies they need. They're finding ways to come together, to work 
as a community to save the lives of those infected and those at risk. They are finding ways to have a positive outlook for the future. And they seem to have faith that when this does pass, things will get back to normal in due time. And I think they're right. As for the human race, we've been through worse, a lot worse, many times. And we powered through those times, adjusted to the changes, and started again when needed. And I'm sure we'll do the same here. Much like Benza withdrawal, this is temporary. And we will get through it. And I'm so pleased to see people saying hi, finding creative ways to pass their time in isolation, cheering for healthcare workers and other frontline people, helping others, and most of all, putting our differences that we thought were so huge before all this happened behind us, at least temporarily, and coming together. I know it won't last very long once we get past this, but wouldn't it be great if it did? Or even if just a little of it lingered around for a while, and we felt more like one community, one nation, one world again. <laughs> Perhaps that's too much to ask for. But for now, I'm going to soak this in. I hope you're doing okay through all this. And just know that my thoughts are with you. And I'm sure we're all going to come out of this better, stronger, and maybe even a little happier on the other side. Today our format will include our introduction, which you just heard, our Benzo stories, feature, and our moment of peace. Today's feature is rapid-fire Q&A on Benzo's anxiety and so much more. It's a series of questions and answers about benzo-related topics from a variety of sources. I hope you like it. And before we move on, don't forget we need your help. We need feedback of any kind. We truly want to hear from you. You can provide feedback in four ways. Comment directly on one of our podcasts or blog posts so others can see it. Fill out our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback. Email us at podcast at benzofree.org or leave feedback on one of our podcast carriers so others can find us. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign in for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And if you wish to help support what we do here, you can visit our donations page at benzofree.org slash donate. Trust me, every little bit helps. And don't forget, the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Now let's move on to our Benzo stories. Today we are going to share two stories with you. I don't believe either of these need a trigger warning, since they are both short and share messages of hope. I hope you enjoy them as I did. Our first story is from Lenore in Denmark. We will hear from Lenore again briefly in our feature today, but before we do that, I wanted to share with you her story. Lenore writes, Hi D. I started tapering Xanax about a year ago. I have been on benzos for more than 40 years due to anxiety and agoraphobia. I have some bad waves of withdrawal symptoms, but also lots of windows because I am tapering very slowly. I had no idea that my anxiety medicine was messing me up until about a year ago when I started to see a new psychiatrist who told me that lots of my anxiety and agoraphobia problems could be put down to my long-term use of benzodiazepines. But to make things short here, I found the Benzofree website about six months ago and started listening to your podcasts. You have become a lifeline for me. Then suddenly I am blessed with your YouTube channel, your voice, your positive face, reassurances, and the fact that you went through even more than I am facing at the moment makes me feel safe in my tapering and gives me the courage to continue. Your vlog empathizes with our anxiety, but also helps remove some of its sting. Happy thoughts from Lenore, living in Denmark. 
Wow, thank you, Lenore. Especially for the very kind words. Don't know if they're deserved, but I really appreciate them. They, they truly mean the world to me and keep me going. I am so grateful for people like you who take the time, even in the midst of such a difficult journey as Benzo withdrawal, to tell me what the podcast and YouTube channel means. Thank you for that. 40 years is a long time, but you know, I've spoken with many people who have been on these drugs for decades and tapered and recovered fully, and I know you are going to do fine. I was very pleased when I read your email to learn that your psychiatrist alerted you to the possible complications from these medications. So many others have struggled to find a psychiatrist who truly understood about the long-term complications of these medications. And it's very nice to start hearing more and more that some of them are becoming more educated. I'm so glad you found one of them. Lenore has said that she would like to send us a longer version of her story at a later time, and I look forward to sharing it here when she does. Please, take care of yourself, and thanks again for all the support and encouragement. I really hope you keep in touch. Emails like this mean more than you know. Our second story today is from Karen in Carterton, Oxfordshire, England. Karen writes, I have complex PTSD, and I have withdrawn from lorazepam three times over the last 10 years, and I'm currently tapering off diazepam as a means of getting off lorazepam again, equivalent dose and all that jazz. I was only diagnosed with CPTSD five years ago when I found a private trauma-informed therapist after 25 years of misdiagnosis. I have been learning great coping mechanisms since then, and I am enjoying a renewed stability. I would be more than happy to share my withdrawal experiences and give out the hope that I have received in the process. Especially helpful was the epiphany I had a few months ago that there are two real me's. The much more stable, coping, content, and cheerful me, and also the mood swings occasionally trembling, nauseous, restless, foggy-headed, etc., tapering me. And that it's important to recognize that beneath all the withdrawal side effects, there is still the strong me. And not to panic that the withdrawing me is the real me, and I might always feel this way, but to remember that withdrawing ends and the real me reemerges. Also, patience. Damn, I learned so much patience and mindfulness. You can do this. Withdrawing does end, and normal life does resume. Thanks, Karen. I'm so glad you chose to share that message with us. Sorry it took me so long to get it on the podcast. The truth is I wanted to save it for a time when we all needed some positive messages, and I think now is a good time. <laughs> Finding that inner strength, that other you deep inside, that calmer, more rational, more centered, even more spiritual person for some people, can be such a benefit in difficult times, such as benzo withdrawal. Karen explained it so well, and I really appreciate her message of hope and recovery. And like she said, withdrawing does end. Normal life does resume. We do get through this and find a better life on the other side. Now I can say that till I'm blue in my face and I realize that it is still hard to hear and accept for so many. That's why I love it when others who have been there can add their own story to that message and, and emphasize the benefits awaiting us after we heal. Thanks, Karen. And please keep us informed and share any more insights you may have. And we do still need stories. I have only one or two in the queue for next episode, but that is it. So if you've been thinking about sending one in, now is a good time. Just go to the feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And now, without further ado, let's move on to our feature. Our feature today is a rapid-fire Q&A. We're revisiting a format that we've undertaken a couple of times before in a couple different variations. 
and it's one which has been quite popular. In episode 35 of the podcast titled Quick Questions About Anxiety, Insomnia, Benzos, and Withdrawal, we took our first rapid-fire approach to a Q&A about benzos and related subjects. My goal was to answer as many questions as I could in the time allotted, and I think we covered a lot of material. Then in episode 59, titled Questions, Comments, and a Few Answers about Benzodependence and Withdrawal, which came out only last month, we took a slower approach to the Q&A format, took on much fewer questions, but did them more in depth. Now for today, we're going to return to the rapid fire approach. I'll keep my answer short. Well, I'll try. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> but I will try to keep most of them to a minute or two or three or <laughs> something around that. <laughs> the questions today will be about benzos, anxiety, insomnia, happiness, the podcast, life, love, liberty, leisure, luxury, loyalty, lusciousness, libidinousness, libidinousness, I put that one in there just because I wanted to try to say it. <laughs> We're not really going to talk about that, but I wanted to see if I could say the word. One more time. Libidinousness. It says two nisses that really throw you up. Anyway, the truth is most of the questions will be about benzos and related topics because that is what this podcast is about. Still, I might try to sneak in a few other things just for fun. Now, there's no order or organization to these questions. Some come from emails and comments. Some are ones I've heard in passing or through friends in the Benzo community, and others are just ones that I think people might want to know. I hope you enjoy today's feature, and that being said, let's stop dawdling and let's get going. What can we do to change the Benzo prescribing practices of physicians? This question came up a couple of weeks ago as I was working with a team of people in the Benzo community. Since this is all about short answers, let's just touch on three quick things right here. One, team up in your state, province, region, and work with your local health officials and medical establishment to help alert them to this problem. And, and when I say work with them, I mean that. Try and help them understand what you've been through and be willing to listen and understand their side too. I truly believe change comes from understanding. It takes work and time to make these changes, but progress is being made, and it is making a difference. Two, tell your story. On Benzo Free, or on discussion groups, or on other websites, or even more, in the media. The more we tell our stories, the more we make a difference. And most of all three, by being a Benzo patient. One of the key reasons that I tell people to find a doctor to work with during benzo withdrawal, in addition to having the medical support that you need during this difficult process, is that we are making a difference when we do. I can't tell you the number of people I have spoken with who have told me that a prescriber has changed her or his practices just by having them as a patient. In fact, this has happened to me multiple times. One by one, we do make a difference. Think about it. If you can educate just one medical professional, just one, think about the number of people that will affect. Perhaps you can help that person change their prescribing practices and maybe even educate them on proper tapering methodologies. If you do that, you are saving lives. I believe that this is how we are truly making a difference more than any other. When caring, open medical professionals see what we're going through over time, I think they have little choice but to reevaluate their practices. Next question. Is polydrugging a big issue in the benzo community? Yes, it is. <laughs> in fact, it's huge. I would guess that half to two-thirds of the people I work with via BenzoFree are on more than one psychiatric medication. Benzos are often just part of the overall problem. And all psychiatric medications can have their own problems, including side effects, possible dependence and withdrawal complications, drug interactions, and a myriad of additional complications. 
Now, I am the last person to say that psychiatric medications are all bad. They aren't. Some are effective and are definitely needed for certain conditions. Even benzos are useful for alcohol detox, certain medical procedures, emergency room management, and others. But I do believe that they can easily be overprescribed. In fact, in many people, they cause more issues than they treat. And for some people, those in serious distress, they wind up taking shoeboxes full of medications and desperately try to find a way out of their nightmare. So yes, I believe that polydrugging is a very big problem and one that needs to be addressed honestly, objectively, and with compassion for those who suffer its effects. Next question. Is it snowing in Colorado right now? Um, yes, it is. And yes, that was an actual question, <laughs> but a brief one at that. Moving on. Are Z drugs benzos? This is a question that someone asked me the other day and which does create some confusion. And here's a brief answer. It depends on who you ask. When I talk about benzos, I'm referring to both classes of drugs. That may not be the case for everyone, but that is how I use the term. These two classes are benzodiazepines, which are classified as anti-anxiety drugs, but are also effective for insomnia and some other conditions. These include Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, Librium, and others. And non-benzodiazepines, or Z-drugs which, while they do have an entirely different chemical composition to benzodiazepines, they still often have similar complications of dependence and withdrawal when taken long-term. These are often prescribed more for sleeping disorders, but also have anxiolytic benefits. These include Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata, and others. So when I say benzos, I'm including benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepines, or Z-drugs. As for what other people mean when they say benzos, it differs, and I could not assume to speak for them. Next question. What are the most potent benzodiazepines? Benzodiazepine potency is usually measured as compared to diazepam, or Valium. Oprazolam, Xanax, Clonazepam, Clonopin, and Triazolam, Halcyon, are the most potent benzodiazepines. Each are 20 times as potent as Valium, according to Ashton's substitution tables, which makes them 50 times as potent as the original benzodiazepine, chlorodiazepoxide, or Librium. Some other sources may vary slightly on potency, but most are in the same ballpark. Next question. What benzo books, other than your own, do you recommend? This one came from someone earlier this year, and I wanted to include it on the podcast. It's a great question, by the way. And please know, I do plan to list more books on our website, that is, when I finally get around to it. Now, I do want to note that during my withdrawal, I didn't read any other Benzo books. I was writing my own, and I didn't want others writing to influence my own. But since I published my book, I did start to read a few and play catch-up. Also, I want to make sure I'm not excluding anyone at all, considering I have not read all the books, not even close. But I do have a couple of favorites that I'd like to mention right here, and I'll put links to them in our show notes. First off is Recovery and Renewal by Baylissa Frederick. Most of you have heard of Baylissa, and of course, we had her on the podcast a few months ago. Amazing woman, and she is so helpful to so many. Anyway, she shares some excellent insight into withdrawal provides some amazing tools and recommendations, and even shares passages from her own journal in her book. I really enjoy reading her book and got a lot out of it. Thanks, Baylissa. And the second book I'd like to mention off the top of my head is Death Grip by Matt Samet. Matt lives near me here in Boulder, Colorado, a great guy, and even more so, an amazing writer. An avid mountain climber, and the former editor of Climbing Magazine, Matt's story is gripping, heart-wrenching, and entertaining throughout. Even if it wasn't about benzos, I would still recommend this book as a good read. Matt writes as I wish I could write. 
Now, I know there are many other amazing books out there, and as I read them and review them, I will try and mention them on the podcast. I am not trying to be exclusionary at all in this list. I just wanted to mention a couple here to get started. Next question. Would you sing a song for us? <laughs> of course. I never turned on a request to sing. Thanks for asking. This song is one I wrote titled, An Ode to a Crimson Moon, and it goes like this. <laughs> You didn't take me seriously, did you? <laughs> I can't sing. Do you really think I would subject you to something like that? I, I like you. Why would I do that to you? <laughs> there, there was a reason I always hid behind the drums when I was on stage. <laughs> uh, I had to take voice in college, actually, and, and sang Summertime from Porgy and Bess on stage in a recital. That is the last time, except for a few drunk nights in some karaoke bars, that... I sang in public, <laughs> and trust me, the world's a better place for that. And no, in case you were wondering, that was not a real question submitted to me. It's just me having a bit of fun. Sorry to scare you on that one. <laughs> Let's move on to the next one. Can this symptom be related to my withdrawal? The answer is yes. Or more realistically, 95% of the time, the answer is yes. Now, you may notice I didn't mention any symptom in that question when I asked it. And that's because it is usually the same answer, regardless. Benzo withdrawal can create a barrage of symptoms. And the variety of symptomology can be extensive. This is your central and peripheral nervous systems which have been affected. There are few, if any, functions in your body which your nerves aren't connected to. Now, do we sometimes attribute symptoms to our withdrawal that weren't caused by it? Of course we do. Even without benzodependence and withdrawal, we used to have some symptoms of all types. Aches, pains, even cognitive and memory problems. So not all of your symptomology during withdrawal can be blamed on benzos. But, <laughs> if you are in moderate to severe withdrawal after long-term use, and are suffering from a variety of symptoms, then <laughs> the odds are it might be the benzos. Especially if it's a symptom that you have never experienced before. But even so, if any symptom is concerning you, it is always a good idea to get it checked out by your physician. Better safe than sorry, right? Next question. Are you going to have any more guests on the podcast anytime soon? Yes, actually. I had already set up guests for April on the podcast, but things have changed temporarily. You see, both of these people were medical professionals, and as we all know, most medical professionals are quite busy right now, working the front and back lines of this virus outbreak, and I thank them. But that also means that those two guests are on the back burner for now. Also, the launch of our YouTube channel has kept me pretty busy, and setting up a guest does take a lot of coordination and time. Still, I do love having guests on the podcast, and I promise more will be coming. If you know of someone who you would like to see as a guest on the podcast, please let me know. If they are not a medical professional who's busy with the virus and everything else going on right now, I'll reach out and see if we can set something up in the near future. This next question came from Anne in Michigan. She said the following excerpt in a recent email. Anne said, Another podcast idea. Given the COVID-19 situation, it might be worth revisiting strategies for dealing with anxiety. Heaven knows we've now got this really is something to be stressed about situation evolving. Well, thanks, Anne. I really appreciate the suggestion. As many of you remember, I took Anne's suggestion and did a whole feature last month in episode 61, Anxiety, Benzos, and a Virus. And we talked in depth about dealing with benzo anxiety in stressful times. But during my research for this episode, I came across her email again and thought there was another angle to take on it, including just some basic tips that I didn't cover in that feature. These are 10 very basic, very simple tips for helping to manage anxiety. I realize that most of these are ones you already know, but it never hurts to have a reminder now, does it? 
So, in the spirit of rapid fire, here they are. One, meditation. Not going to elaborate on that one. You already know about it. Two, exercise. Same here. You know this one. But I always want to make sure I remind you. It's that important. Three, pet your dog, cat, or any pet you have. Well, if it's one you want to pet. <laughs> if it's a fish, maybe it's better not to try to pet it. But petting your pet truly does relax. It's been shown in studies and it can be really helpful. Four, take a time out for yourself. This can be especially helpful when you are required to stay at home most of the time and people in your family are starting to get on each other's nerves. Five, avoid alcohol and caffeine. We all know caffeine revs you up, which can make your symptoms and anxiety increase. And although alcohol can seem like a temporary relief, it does come with its own set of dependence issues and will most likely make it worse in the end. Also, most experts recommend avoiding alcohol as much as possible during your withdrawal. Excessive sugar can also be added here since it can rev up your anxiety, much like caffeine. Number six, dance. <laughs> yes, it sounds basic and even a bit silly, but it really can help. If you feel embarrassed, do it when you are alone. Go to your bedroom or go to your basement and crank up the music and just dance for a while. It's very therapeutic and it does help. Number seven, sing. Just like dancing, you can do this alone if you prefer, and it can help lift your spirits. Yes, even I have been known to sing when I'm by myself, but not when people are around. Number eight, socialize. While we can't do a lot of in-person socialization these days, we do have some pretty amazing technology like FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, or whatever tool you use to connect with your friends. Socializing helps us take our minds off our own problems, especially if you can steer the conversation away from benzos and the virus. Number nine, play with your kids. This is the perfect time to spend more time with your children. It helps them. It helps you. Do I need to say more? And ten, laugh. I mentioned this on easing anxiety last week, but I want to repeat it here at the end. Life right now is serious enough. Find ways to lift your spirits through levity. Watch funny movies, TV shows, YouTube clips, whatever. But find ways to laugh and de-stress when you can. There, that's 10 quick tips. I hope they help. Next question. What is the capital of Luxembourg? Answer, Luxembourg City. <laughs> No, that has absolutely nothing to do with benzos, but I was curious and wanted to look it up. And well, if you didn't know it already, now you know, and so do I. See, we're getting smarter every day. <laughs> Next question. This one is from Lenore in Denmark. Yes, the same Lenore we just heard from in our benzo story section. Here is part of a comment she just sent to me earlier this week. Lenore writes, I am a new member of Benzo Free. I have listened to quite a few of your past podcasts and enjoy your new YouTube channel. Would it be okay if I shared the channel and your Benzo Free website with Benzo groups online? I am a member of a couple different groups. Thank you, Lenore. Yes, please, spread the word as much as you can. It truly does help, and I appreciate it. We still don't have a social media presence for a variety of reasons, and thus, word of mouth is our greatest marketing tool. Now, I realize that sometimes there are restrictions with some online groups as to what you are allowed to post. So please, make sure you follow the guidelines of each group. But yes, anything you can do to help spread the word about what we do here helps. I, I don't spend much time anymore on the discussion boards or online groups, mostly because I'm just too busy with the podcast and with videos. So any help is appreciated. I know some of our listeners have helped spread the word in the past, and I am very grateful. The truth is, building an audience takes a while. And the more people who follow what we do on Benzo Free and Easing Anxiety, then the more people we help, and the more likely we can remain viable and maybe start to become financially stable. So yes, please tell your friends. I am working on the website for Easing Anxiety as we speak, and will let you know when it is up and running, which will give us an easy domain to send to people so they can find us. 
For now, the easiest way to get to either benzofree or easing anxiety is through the benzofree website at benzofree.org. There's a link to the easing anxiety webpage and channel there on the homepage of benzofree. Thanks, Lenore. I really appreciate your support. Next question. What did the chicken say to the duck as it was about to cross the road? Answer, don't do it, man. You'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> that one came to me courtesy of my friend and one of our listeners, Steve from Iowa. Thanks, Steve. I hope you don't mind that I shared that here. I just wanted to break things up a bit. <laughs> I appreciate it. Let's move on to the next question. What are rescue pills? This one came from a chat with someone the other day, and I thought it would be good to include it here. Some patients like to carry what they call a rescue pill with them during withdrawal, especially after they have tapered. This is a benzo pill intended for extreme cases when their symptoms and or anxiety are more than they can handle. While it may provide a sense of security for the patient, it can also lead to updosing if used. And this can create more complications during the withdrawal process down the line. Since most of us know that updosing should be avoided if at all possible, carrying a rescue pill can be seen as an open door to a dangerous place and may be too hard to resist when times are tough. Please work with your doctor on anything related to your dosage or your taper. Next question. Is it ever acceptable to reinstate or updose? I wanted to follow up the last question with this one, and this one may not be under a minute or two or three minutes, but I'll do my best. A good friend of mine in the benzo community asked me about reinstating just a couple of days ago, and I wanted to mention the subject here. She was seriously considering reinstating on her medication to find any relief and to ease her suicidal thoughts. When she reached out to some friends in the Benzo community, she received some very strong responses, which confused her even more and left her wondering where to turn. Like I said before, I can't advise anyone on tapering or dosing, as you know. I am not a medical professional. Most experts in the Benzo community agree that it is best to avoid reinstatement and updosing whenever possible. If you do, your attempts to taper again may be more difficult through a process known as kindling. As many of you are aware, I'm not a fan of absolutes. I'm not a black and white thinker. I'm far more often somewhere in the gray area in debates. Even ones that appear to be clear cut with only one side, I always see the other side. Thus, no surprise that I do see exceptions here. The biggest exception is when the life of the patient is at risk. Suicidality is a factor with many people in benzo withdrawal. I wish to hell it wasn't, but it is. I have worked with many people who have dealt with suicidal thoughts. I, I try to help them when I can, but in the process, always refer them to suicide support services to get professional help. If someone becomes suicidal or violent or in severe, unbearable pain, the answer to this question becomes a bit more complicated. I am not about to advise anyone on whether they should reinstate or updose. It is the patient's decision to be made in partnership with his or her doctor. But I do want to say, please, don't be too hard on yourself. If you need to take drastic action to save your life or to protect the lives of those around you or just to be able to bear this experience for one more day, then you're going to do what you have to do to get through. Avoiding updosing at all costs is not very effective if it leads the person to suicide. Please, if you have to reinstate or updose, then don't beat yourself up about it. You can still taper and become benzo-free at a later time. Sometimes stabilizing is the right answer, especially in extreme circumstances. I know, because I did it too. 
I updosed during my taper. In hindsight, was it the right decision at the time? Probably not. But at that time, I was in a panic attack, out of town, and did the best I could. In the end, I still finished my taper and became benzo-free. Please, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't let the stress and worry of making difficult decisions make your condition even worse. These can be very difficult times, and you are doing the best you can under the circumstances. Be kind to yourself. Take your time, work with your doctor on your taper and dosage, and you will get there. By the way, my friend, she let me know earlier this week that she got through her wave and is doing much better now. I don't know if she reinstated or not, and I don't need to know. It's none of my business. All I know is that she is still with us, and to me, that's a win. Next question. Have you come across any new info about benzos, any new studies lately? Now, this isn't a question from one specific person, more so a composite of questions from conversations I've been a part of recently. The answer is yes, there is always new information coming out about benzos and new studies. The problem for me is trying to keep up with all of them. Thankfully, I have friends, many of you who are listeners to the podcast, who send me things and help to keep me informed. I don't always report on these items in the podcast. To be honest, I'm not as focused on news as I used to be in the content of the podcast. I'm more focused on the connection and on supporting individuals as we all try to recover. But I do value the research, and I read the research, and it truly helps me to understand what we are going through better. So I can provide maybe a more educated podcast as we go along. But to answer the question there, let's see, there was a French research study that just came across my email a week ago. It's, it's not new, but it was new to me. And through the Benzo community, um, we actually got it translated into English. And there also, there's one I've been focused on lately that I, I might want to mention here. You see, I'm always looking for official statements and studies from major medical organizations about benzodiazepines from groups like the AMA, BMA, APA, and others. And during that research a couple months ago, I came across a couple of snippets from a task force study by the American Psychiatric Association, APA, back in 1990. But I couldn't find any full text of this online. Thus, I broke down and bought a used copy of the official publication. And I went through it with my trusty highlighter and ballpoint pen and just marked the hell out of it. The official title of the report is Benzodiazepine, Dependence, Toxicity, and Abuse, a task force report of the American Psychiatric Association, published by the American Psychiatric Association, Washington, D.C. Now, almost as interesting as what was in this document were the names of the doctors who were on the task force, but that discussion will have to come at a later time. Now, this task force report was published by the APA back in 1990, which got me thinking perhaps I should take a look at a more updated version, but that might be a bit difficult. You see, I can't find one. <laughs> this is the last task force report on benzos by the APA that I can find, and it's 30 years old. Now, there is far too much to talk about from this document here, and a lot of good stuff, really good stuff to talk about. Enough for a whole podcast episode, but not for today. Still, I will leave you with just a few quick quotes so you get a taste of what is in here. And in preface, let me just say that I'm going to interject some comments of my own here and there, which may not seem objective, so forgive me for a moment while I step on my own little soapbox for a second. <laughs> so these comments are directly from the APA's task force report. From Chapter 10, Conclusions, Section 3, the report read, Physiological dependence on benzodiazepines, as indicated by the appearance of discontinuant symptoms, can develop with therapeutic doses. 
Okay, so I don't know if that hit you like it hit me, but according to this task force, they recognized physiological dependence 30 years ago. If that is the case, how come so many psychiatrists didn't get the memo? <laughs> Let's continue. In section six of the same chapter, the report read, quote, Repeated daily administration of therapeutic doses of benzodiazepines may contribute to the development of dependence, and such long-term use may be a growing public health concern, since the severity of discontinuance symptoms may increase as drugs are taken for longer periods. So in that, they said growing health concern, that sounds about right, and severity, they got that right too. <laughs> Unfortunately, in other parts of this report, they still miss the boat on how long symptomology may last. But we'll discuss that at another time. Our final quote, same chapter, is section 14. The report reads, quote, This task force suggests the development of guidelines for reasonable prescribing and appropriate clinical management of benzodiazepines, with the advice and concurrence of treating professions, and vigorous educational interventions aimed at physicians and the general public. Hmm. And this section also goes on to call for ongoing epidemiological studies of treatment practices. Now, I'm not sure about you, but this statement seems pretty clear. Hmm. So I'm wondering what happened. Okay, <laughs> stepping off my soapbox now. Sorry about that. I must make it clear here, this document does need to be reviewed in its entirety for all the statements to be understood in context. Also, I do realize that even if the APA has not undertaken another task force analysis on benzos in the past 30 years, they have done some studies and published more recent reports, which should be factored into our analysis here. But all that being said, it is clear to me that the APA recognized physiological dependence to benzodiazepines a long time ago. And it doesn't appear that prescribing practices have changed much in the 30 years that followed. Hmm. Okay, moving on. Our next question came from Cindy in Louisiana. This is an excerpt from her email. You said Tiger Woods had had problems with benzos. Are there other celebrities? Now, I don't talk about celebrity culture on this podcast too much, and that's often by design. I, I want the focus to be on us, the average person who struggles with this beast, than on some actor or singer who was famous and thus draws more attention. But that being said, I did write about celebrities and benzos in my book, and I'll share a bit of that with you here. Now, Tiger Woods did have a very public battle. In May of 2017, he was found asleep behind the wheel of his car by the police. He was slurring his speech and was arrested for DUI. But his alcohol test was negative. You see, he had taken Xanax earlier that day along with Vicodin, a prescription opioid, for his back pain. And as many of you know, that combination can cause severe sedation lack of coordination, and even death in some people. But unfortunately, most media stories focused on the DUI arrest, and very few talked about the benzodiazepine. But many other celebrities have had issues with benzos, and their stories drew the public's eye. Names many of us will recognize, such as Tammy Faye Baker, Boris Becker, Chris Brown, Judy Garland, Paris Hilton, Whitney Houston, Chao Seng Hyung, T.O.P., Courtney Love, John Mayer, Brittany Murphy, Stevie Nicks, Ozzy Osbourne, Don Simpson, Anna Nicole Smith, Elizabeth Taylor, David Foster Wallace, Amy Winehouse, and the list goes on. And then, of course, there are the unlucky few who had benzos in their system when they passed away, such as Elvis Presley, Margot Hemingway, Keith Ledger, Michael Jackson, Chris Cornell, Tom Petty, Lil Peep, and more. That is just a small representation of the list, but I think enough for now. 
Next question. What are the different types of benzo withdrawal symptoms? This question came from a listener in India. As some of you know, I did a 14 part series on the symptoms of benzo withdrawal and I used the same breakdown in my book. But it's been a while since I've done either, so thought it might be a good idea to mention those categories here again briefly. If you want to learn more, please take a look at our podcast archives for those episodes. And I do want to note that I based my symptom categories primarily on the Ashton manuals. I list two primary categories here, psychological symptoms and physical symptoms. Under psychological symptoms, we have anxiety symptoms, behavioral symptoms, cognitive symptoms, excitability symptoms, perception symptoms, sleeping symptoms, and social symptoms. Under physical symptoms, we have abdominal and gastrointestinal symptoms, symptoms of the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, symptoms of the head and neck, symptoms of the heart and lungs, muscular symptoms, nerve sensations, and immune and endocrine symptoms. There. I hope that helps as a quick refresher. And on that note, I think we're going to wrap up our feature. Please let me know what you thought about our topic today. I'd really love to hear your feedback. I, I hope that these quick questions do help and are informative, and I'm happy to keep doing them if you'd like to hear more. Now, before we move on to our moment of peace, please bear with me for about 30 seconds for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal or professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today we are going to return to one of the standards on this podcast. And that is a basic breathing meditation. I try to return to this one every few episodes or so because it is one of the most popular, useful, and effective methods of meditation. All you have to do is focus on your breath. That's it. So let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. And focus your attention on your breath. 
if your mind wanders, which it will, just gently bring it back to your breathing. No judgment at all. Continue to do this for one minute. Next episode is episode 64, and it will be released May 1st. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let us know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.